in 1972, the late Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Archbishop Sheen shares his messages, Jesus Christ Superstar, Super Scar, and Christ Self-Giving, Parts 1 and 2. You have all heard a phrase which is used in psychology about transference. It is the, the putting on to another of credit, blame, burden, or responsibility. Now let me give you this morning three examples of transference. Physical, financial, and moral. Physical transference. You have all seen that picture of a boy carrying another one who was a cripple. And the title of the picture was, He's not heavy, he's my brother. That's physical transference. Another form of transference, financial. This morning when I came out here early, I went to Holiday Inn and I went in to have pancake and maple syrup and a cup of coffee. And Mr. Eichenberger came in and said, uh, Dr. Schuler has already paid the bill. That's financial transference. Thank you. <laughs> if I had known he was going to do it, I would have ordered quail on toast. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that kind of transference. I'm concerned about bringing to you the very essence of the life of our blessed Lord. And I want to show to you how he took upon himself or transferred to himself three different areas of our lives. There was physical transference, there was mental transference, and there was moral transference. He took upon himself all of our burdens and responsibilities, physical, mental, moral. He took them totally and completely. He's a God, in other words, who took his own medicine. He gave us freedom. We brought a number of ills upon ourselves, and he came and took the effects of that freedom. I can remember when I was a boy, and all of you who are over 39 can thank God that you never lived in what was known as the castor oil period of life. <laughs> but my grandmother used to give me castor oil, and before she would give it to me, she would take it herself and say, see, there's nothing to it, it's easy. She was taking her own medicine. God does that. So let us see how he took his own medicine physically. As a result of the evil in this world and abuse of freedom, we have all kinds of disease and sickness. We read in the Gospel of Matthew a prophecy taken from Isaiah that our blessed Lord took upon himself our sicknesses and our illnesses. We have no reason to believe that our blessed Lord was ever physically sick, because it seems as if no one had any power over him until he said, all right, this is your hour to evil. They could not arrest him, they could not throw him over the precipice. So it's not likely that he was ever physically sick. How then did he take upon himself our sicknesses and our illnesses? I think by what might be called a very deep empathy. There isn't a mother in this audience or on television who, having had a sick child, has not said, I would like to take on the sufferings of that child. Any one of you mothers that has a delinquent daughter or a delinquent son suffers more 
for that son than the son suffers. Why? Because you're identified with that child. So our blessed Lord, therefore, I feel by empathy, felt all the sicknesses of the world. When, for example, he touched the blind man, I'm sure that he felt all the blindness of the universe. He felt the blindness, for example, of a Milton. All the lights of the world went out. And when he touched the deaf man, I'm sure that he felt all the harmonies of the world to cease. He felt the deafness of a Beethoven. When he touched the leper, and he touched the leper, I'm sure he felt leprosy. And that is one of the reasons why we find often that when our blessed Lord healed the sick, that he sighed. He groaned. He wept. He transferred to himself all sicknesses, lameness, and the ills to which mankind is heir to, in order that we could never say, God does not know what it is to suffer. He had it before. He took his own medicine. Then there was mental transference. Who is going to give sympathy, for example, to the mentally retarded? Does God know anything about the mentally handicapped? Then the agnostics, the skeptics, the doubters, those who have lost their faith. Does God know anything, for example, about the despair of a Sartre or a Camus? or anyone who has given up the shade and shadow of the cross for, for any kind of self-imposed guilt. God knows all about that, and he transferred all of those illnesses to himself. And in one dark moment when he was unfurled on a cross like a wounded eagle, The sun refused to shed its light upon the crime of deicide. Nature is not always sympathetic to our moods, but it was sympathetic to his. And in that darkness at midday, he took upon himself all of the mentally handicapped and all the doubts and despairs and anxieties of people and express them all in one great moment of transference. My God, my God, why? Why? Why hast thou abandoned me? It was the moment when God asked the why of God. It was the second when Christ was at the very gates of hell itself. He took his own medicine. And that is why the despairing need never despair, and the hopeless need ever be without hope. He took on their hatred, their atheism, he felt it as if it were his own. And in that moment, he redeemed all of the skepticism of the universe. And then there came one other moment. It was a bigger one, in which there was not physical transference of ills, not a mental transference, but a moral transference of guilt. We're all sinners. We have a tendency to project our guilt. 
We blame it onto other people. Blame it onto God, we blame it on the church, we blame it on the government, we blame it on neighbors. So there's a tremendous pile of garbage someplace in this world. And all of that guilt that we have projected he had to take upon himself to clear it out. Believe me, the only pollution that is in this world is not in the atmosphere. There's a moral pollution that is far worse. And that he took upon himself in his death. And he took all sins upon himself as if he himself were guilty. And that was why, for example, when in the courtroom of Annas he was accused of being blas a blasphemy, he did not answer because we have blasphemed. Seven times he spoke before Pilate, seven times he was silent. Seven times he spoke as shepherd, seven times he was silent as the sheep. The victim of lamb that had to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And so every, any sin that we have ever committed, of mind or heart or body, he took upon himself and paid the debt as if it were his own. This was the greatest of all of his acts of transference. And then when he rose from the dead, then he made it possible for us to say, well now, I'm forgiven. He's conquered. Conquered all of this evil. And we give ourselves completely and totally to him. So gather up then, if you please, all of the ills that have afflicted mankind. He bore them all on a tree. Think as if mankind were today afflicted by a plague. And suppose this plague was like the Black Death that destroyed over one third the population of Europe at the close of the Middle Ages. Suppose some great scientist here in California developed a cure for the plague. And he made it available for everyone. Would we go? There would be some who would say, well, how do I know he's got a cure? Why should I bother going to a laboratory? I can take care of myself in my own home. And so we would die of the plague. And that's the way it is with the cross of Christ. He has the remedy for resignation to his will and physical and mental suffering. He has the remedy for sin, forgiveness at the cross. And all who come to him are healed. The looking at Christ on the cross. Remember when the Egyptians, I mean the Israelites crossing the desert, were bitten by poisonous serpents. And God said to Moses, make a serpent of brass that looks just exactly like that serpent. And hang it up on the crotch of a tree. And everyone who looks at that serpent on the crotch of that tree will be healed of the snake bite. Now that's crazy. There's nothing that will cure a snake bite by looking at a brass serpent. But it was a type of something else. And later on when our blessed Lord came, he had a conversation with Nicodemus. And he said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent of brass on the tree, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. When our blessed Lord was lifted up on that cross, he was like that brass serpent. That brass serpent had no poison in it. But the serpent looked as if it were poison. When Christ was on the cross, 
He looked as if he were guilty because he bore all of our sins. But there was no more guilt or sin in him than there was poison in that serpent. And all who look upon him are healed. This is the saving Christ who transfers all our guilt to himself and we need only ask for his pardon. And we can continue this in our own lives and help redeem souls. I remember some years ago there was a woman who wrote to me and told me to visit a brother of hers. He was in a hospital dying of cancer. She said that he was a very evil man. He tried to destroy the morals of the young. And he now had developed a hatred of God and everyone. And she said, he's throwing out 10 priests. Will you please go to see him? Last resort, she. So I knew I wouldn't be treated any better than anyone else. And so I opened the door with the first night and I said, good evening, William, and closed the door. Next night I came back, said, good evening, William, how are you? Closed the door and I went down for 40 nights straight. But I never mentioned the subject of religion because I knew I'd be thrown out. And the last night I said, William, you're going to die tonight. He said, I know it. You want to make your peace with God? He said, no. Get out. So I knelt down alongside of his bed and I promised the good Lord that if he would show some sign of repentance before he died, that I would build a church for the black people in Alabama. Now I wasn't very well able to do that because I was a professor and my salary was $1,800 a year. And the church I promised was only 3,500, I think. But at any rate, I wanted to be associated with the redemption of our Lord. And after the prayer and the promise, I said, will you make your peace with God? He said, no, get out. He ordered me out. I went back to him quickly and put my head alongside of his cancerous face. And I said, William, say my Jesus mercy before you die. He said, I will not. Well, I received a word four o'clock in the morning that he died. And the nurse said, about 10 minutes after you left, he started saying, my Jesus mercy. And he never stopped saying it until he died at four o'clock in the morning. So there's a price tag on every soul in the world. And when we associate souls with the redemption of Christ, we too help save them.